Welcome back to Bottled Up, where we pop open the stories behind local businesses and their owners. I'm your host, Andrew Allen, and today we have a real treat for you. Our guest is Dave Melton, owner-operator of Rockin' Chicken and Waffles in Diaberville, Mississippi. In this episode, we're diving deep into the world of classic Southern comfort food and the power of exceptional customer service. Dave will share his journey from being a musician and a radio personality to fulfilling his dream as a local business owner. Plus, we'll also discuss the importance of creating a strong online presence and being easily accessible to customers. From social media to Google AdWords, Dave will enlighten us on the strategies that have helped his restaurant thrive. So grab a Pepsi and get ready to savor the stories and insights that Dave Melton has to offer. Mr. Dave Melton, owner-operator of Rockin' Chicken and Waffles, thank you for coming on the Bottled Up Podcast. Oh, you're very welcome. Nice to be talking with you today. Absolutely. So I'm very interested. So you you haven't been a restaurateur very long, but it's something that you have always kind of wanted to be as far as an entrepreneur is concerned. You had a history in radio. Could you kind of go back in time a little bit and let's talk about kind of how what you started off doing i know that you have a musical background as well so um you've lived on the coast your whole life yeah well mostly my whole life i lived with my aunt and and moved to dallas but from the beginning you know it always started with music and it was with my <clears throat> my aunt and uncle and we started in gospel music and my mother actually you know she sang for elvis years ago back in the 50s so there there's been a musical influence in our life forever and so my father was the one that was in radio and television he did news and he also was an anchor man on WLOX Okay. So he always did news and and that's how I got into it. So you kind of have that, needless to say, you kind of have that entertaining kind of mindset in your blood, right? Yeah, it's in our blood. We're, we're now three generations into it. I did play music when I was young. I started touring with, uh, with uh, gospel music and then I started getting into rock and roll music. And so I toured in Dallas when I was a teenager and uh, did that. What instruments did you play? I played guitar, bass, drums, a little bit of keyboards. So I was very uh, flexible when it came to that. And uh, I started doing studio work in Dallas at a place called Crystal Clear Recording Studios. And so I would be the hired musician. Let's call it that. Got it. Yeah. Uh, they call it, what do they call that? Uh, um, it's like a, there's a, spe- a special name for it. It's not a, st- a session, a session musician, right? I was a session player. Right. That's what I was. So how old were you when you were doing this kind of stuff? I started young, man. I was like 15, 16 years old when I was doing that. That's incredible. I was on a tour bus when I was 16 years old and uh, managed to do that through my 20s. I still do it to this day, but I do it part time. It's more of a hobby. Yeah. I mean, you kind of have to, I I would imagine that doing that kind of a lifestyle, you kind of have to dedicate your whole, you have to give all of yourself to that, correct? Absolutely. I mean, it's uh, it's really tough living on a tour bus. <laughs> we used to argue over, you know, we'd go get a hotel room and it was like, who was going to stay on the bus and who was going to go stay in the hotel? So it was, you know, when you're traveling with seven or eight people, it's it's difficult. Yeah, I can imagine there's a lot of dynamics that start and stop on a, a tour bus. Yes, for sure. So Growing up with music kind of around you, um, did you always, did your mom and dad always have music playing? Did did they constantly have music in the house? Was it always around you? Oh, absolutely. And I guess I'll go back to the beginning. When I was very young, my father was already on the radio. Okay. And so we always had music playing around us. And then my father would take me to the radio station. As a kid, I would be eight, nine years old. And we'd be waking up at three in the morning because he he did the news on the radio station. 
And I would hang out with the disc jockeys and they'd be playing records back in the 70s. Yeah. It was it was almost like WKRP in Cincinnati, you know, that that old show that you you see all the uh, the disc jockeys. I'd be hanging out with them while he was doing the news. So you're nine years old, hanging out in a room full of grown men, disc jockeys. That's right. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. So like, was the behavior censored for a nine-year-old or were you just around it all the time? No, those guys, they would sit there and they, they'd they spin, uh, you know, spin records. And I would ask every once in a while, hey, can you play ZZ Top or you can, <laughs> can you... Can you play, you know, this band and they grab the record and spin it. That's awesome. But yeah, it influenced me a great deal to be in radio and television and to do music. So you grew up surrounded by that. When did you think that, and I know that in every young person's life, there comes a time where they kind of have to find their path and they have to buckle down and, and realize, all right, this is what I'm going to try to do. And I, it, from the sound of it, you were on a tour bus. When did you decide to stop touring playing music and to kind of hone yourself in a career in radio and broadcasting i don't think i ever did i did the both of them simultaneously so i was still in a band i've been in a band up till you know a month ago really? i've been in a band for years but also did radio and television that was my main career with Coast Radio Group is who I worked with forever. They were great people, great influences. And they were always like, okay, get your work done. And then you can do the other stuff on the side. Right. So they were always very, uh, very good about that. So I've always been in a band too. I decided to do radio because my father was in radio. And he also used to be an investigator too during the day. And so I asked him one time, I said, hey, dad, I want to be an investigator. And he goes, son, why do you want to do that? And so he would never give me a clear answer. So I went into radio. When you say investigator, Dave, what do you mean? What do you mean by investigator, like an investigative reporter or a P.I.? No, he was no, he worked for the Harrison County Sheriff's Department. Okay, so he was a detective. Yeah, he was a detective. Okay. I, I'll be honest with you, man. I love sleep too much to want to be a detective. Um, you know, cause it, <laughs> you get that call, you're up. You're, you you can't say, nah, man, give me about an hour. I'll be there. You get that call. You're out, you're up and you're out. Well, I never really saw my dad too much because he had, he had three jobs. Right. In the morning, he would get up at, you know, three, four a.m and do radio news, then he would go work at the Harrison County Sheriff's Department, and then at night, he would be anchorman on WLOX. That's a highly interesting, that's three, I mean... Three jobs, yeah. Yeah, the, the first the first and the third kind of feel each other out, but the, the investigator detective part, like, would he ever read news stories that he was investigating? Um, he actually did. He was offered a job at ABC, NBC, and CBS. Years ago, there was a uh, a fire in Biloxi at the jail. And this we're talking about we're talking about the 70s now. Okay. It was a pretty severe fire at the jail. And ABC and CBS and NBC called him. And my father said, Do I have to move? They said, Yeah, you would have to move to North Carolina and then New York. And he goes, no, no, thank you. Yeah. It, he just stayed here. Yeah. I Being from here as well, born and raised, I kind of totally understand the mindset behind that. Um, we kind of live in a really special place. Right, right. Well, Dave, so let me ask you. So when did you get into the broadcasting engineer business? When did you first start with Coast? I started with Coast in 1989, September, and I was a disc jockey. It used to be Power 108, uh -huh. and I was a 7 to midnight DJ. I became pretty successful doing that over the course of the years as far as ratings and things like that. And then they offered me the afternoon slot and I did that. But then I, I was more really interested in electronics. Okay. And so you have transmitters, you have studios that have to be repaired, lightning, weather issues. And I decided to get into that. So I spent about two years doing that uh, as a disc jockey and then kind of started hanging around broadcast engineers. 
and learning and uh, learning the trade as far as that goes. So what's the most prized if, if you're a disc jockey and you go into a new market or you go into a, a new a new radio group? What's the most prized spot? What's the what's the spot you always want? What's their prime time? Is it like the the eight the eight in the morning guy or the afternoon guy? Well, mornings are great, but you know, as far as I go, I, I just don't want to wake up at three or four in the morning, you know, on a daily basis and go go in. But afternoons, uh, when people get off work and they're driving home, right, that's pretty prime time right there because everybody's in their car, they're listening to radio, they're hearing music, but they're also hearing advertisements as well. So that's pretty prime time. Okay, so the afternoon spot would be the one. I would say afternoons and mornings. Okay, so you work at Coast Radio Group. You're there for how long? I was there since 1989. You were there 36 years. 36 years. I left in uh, February of this year. I know that your daughter works there now, too. Yes, yeah, she sure does. She <laughs> she has two jobs, too. I, I guess it runs in the family. She works for the Harrison County Sheriff's Department. Lord. She does 911. She works 12-hour shifts overnight. And then she'll go into the radio station and do a show. She's uh, Jesse Page on the radio on 95.3 Gorilla. So she does, she's a 911 operator. Yes. Man, I, I can't imagine how, how stressful that can be at times. It can be. I mean, they get they get silly calls sometimes, and sometimes they get very intense calls. Right. And I do, you know, I do worry about her sometimes because uh, she has to deal with with the stress of uh, pretty severe events. Absolutely, it doesn't get more real than an, an emergency, realistic, you know, nine one one call. That's that's about as real as it gets. Yeah, it it can be. And she's uh, she's 26 years old, and so, so yeah, I do worry about her sometimes. I totally understand, man. I have a, I have two young daughters myself, so I, I can put myself in your place and and uh, kind of feel feel for you there. But I'm I'm pretty sure that she's got a good head on her shoulders. Oh, she's she's smart. She can handle it. And if she can't, she'll call and consult one of us or her her bosses. You never got into law enforcement, did you? No, my dad had told me you got. He would never answer me. I was like always I was in I was actually in the fire department. Okay. For, so I got into that and I did radio simultaneously and would go put out fires at nights or do accidents or things like that. So I did that for a couple of years with the fire department, but I never got into law enforcement. It seems as if there's another generational thing with your family, Dave, is that you you are all very they're very hard nosed and hard working people. Oh yeah, we we've, we've always had to be. I mean, I've been working hard, and, and my partner has too since we were young. Right, I mean, it's a different generation. We started working. I know that she started working when she was, you know, ten, eleven, twelve. I yeah. know I was working when I was twelve years old. Yeah, same here. So I mean, we we've, we've always had to to do what we had to do. And it's a, it's a generational thing, I think. I think so too. I think you might be onto something there. Whenever I was a kid, I started almost, I was 12 years old. I started, uh, I was getting bored after school and I was kind of riding my bike around getting in trouble with friends. So my dad kind of utilized, uh, working at, to try to put me in a position where he knew where I was. Right. Exactly. You know, so it, it was a double edged sword. It taught me, um, it taught me what it felt like to earn a paycheck, but it also taught me, um, you know, a little bit of discipline. I got to be around grown, grown ups and adults, and I was surrounded by, you know, men in their 40s and 50s who, um, were not it holding their character. It, it really does. Yeah. It really does. I, uh, I, I've spent most of my life around people 20, 30 years older than me, you know? So I, I think that it kind of puts you in a mindset of an older, it develops you as an old soul, I guess. It certainly makes your work ethic uh, a lot better as you get older, for sure. Absolutely. So you left the radio station in February of this year yes. and you decided that you were going to you were you were wanting to do something on your own. So what is the what is the name of your partner you decided to go into the restaurant business with? Her name is Manling Birch or Ling Birch, L I N G Birch. Okay. She has extensive uh, knowledge in the restaurant business. 
I mean, she grew up in it. She she started in Hong Kong and uh, wound up in Los Angeles and then had a restaurant in uh, New Orleans. Okay. And so she she has a, a lot of history. Her mother is a, a, a chef. And so uh, she brings a lot to the table when Absolutely. it comes to running our business, for sure. Absolutely. Sounds like someone that uh, it would be a dream to open up a restaurant with. Yeah, she she's, you know, impeccable. I don't know if I could have done it without her, to be honest with you. So how did you come up with the concept of rock and chicken and waffles? It's a very, it's a unique concept, Dave. Yeah, I, I, I'll tell you what happened. I always wanted to have, you see these little burger joints all over the place. You see them in Gulfport. You see them in Pascagoula. My sister and I went to uh, Disney World. We went to this little place in the Magic Kingdom and they served chicken and waffles. So as I'm sitting here talking about opening this burger joint, my sister tells me, why don't you just do chicken and waffles? And I thought about it for a minute and people love it. They love it. And yeah. so yeah. we decided to do that instead of just, we do sell burgers and, and other things, wraps and salads and and all of that. So we, we kind of pull it all together, but chicken and waffles is the theme of the restaurant. And of course, the rocking part comes from me being in rock music for years. How many dishes, let's say you're starting to prep this, how many dishes did you have in your back pocket where you could be like, all right, I have eight to nine things that I can cook really, really well. Um, you know, so I know these can be on the menu. Like how many of those, how does it work opening up a restaurant like that? Walk me through it. Well, you've got to start small. And I'll, okay. I'll, t I'll tell you why, because you don't want to confuse people, number one. Even though she had a, a, a restaurant in Hong Kong and they did primarily authentic Chinese food, we did not want to confuse people. So we started with the Southern American, you know, chicken and waffles, hamburgers, French fries, uh, mozzarella sticks, wraps, right. those kind of things. So we're still in our infancy as far as our restaurant goes, we're, we're in business now for five months. So we're, we're still very young, but we're yeah. growing our menu. Now we're doing like quesadilla and we're about to start doing breakfast. Okay. That makes total sense, Dave. I mean, with what you're serving, I mean, you, I, you're in the South, people eat fried chicken for breakfast. Right. <laughs> and then we'll do, uh, we'll, we'll serve traditional, uh, breakfast menu like, uh, biscuits, sausage gravy you know we'll we'll do that and uh we're we're just starting off small so we don't have a a, a giant menu okay so that's that would be a big tip for somebody who is wanting to get into the the restaurant business is you know you just find what two or three dishes that you know are knockouts and focus on those and eventually kind of branch off from there yeah that's wild we originally started with this thing called the uh the chicken and waffle sandwich which we would take chicken, put it on a waffle, cut it into basically a quarter and uh, make sandwiches out yeah. of it with yeah. lettuce, tomatoes, onions, pickles, whatever. And we can modify it, but and dip it in whatever sauce you want. But what's crazy is a lot of people like the classic chicken and waffle, the, the standard waffle with the chicken on it. Yeah. Yeah. Knife and fork. Yeah. I know that I've got some reviews. I know that, uh, there's a lady who worked for us, Miss Rhonda, who does all of y'all's oh, orders. I love her, man. She's yeah, great. yeah. She she apparently has said that she is addicted uh, to y'all's <laughs> chicken. So she's got she's got a. If y'all have any rehab programs, you'll be willing to fund and pay for. She's addicted to it. I love her, man. Uh, she she's great. She comes by, but you know, I guess the key to it is we like to talk to people a lot. We like to sit down, get to know them, and, and we'll just start a conversation with them and get to know them, tell stories, and then they come back. We have a lot of repeat customers because of that. Right. And uh, the other thing we do is we have, we try to get, we have our food is quality. They try to sell us frozen food and frozen chicken and all of that. And we said, no, we're going to do fresh. So, I mean, it's a lot of prep, but it's worth it. The quality versus talking to the customers and, and 
Well, yeah, it's it's all all part of it, man. It's all part of being a local local business. I mean, that's that's what separates you from you know just your your standard restaurant, right? It you're right. actually a you're a local business owner in the community, and you actually care about what your customers think, and you want to make sure that you give them the best food that they can get. That's right. That's right. Exactly right. That's kind of how we operate as well. I mean, we well, the one thing that I can control is my level of service and how I treat my customers. Man, y'all have been great to us, to be honest with you. Well, David, I, I, I appreciate it, man. And I, I don't really know the story of how we kind of hooked up with each other. Um, and if, But if you wanted to tell that, I would appreciate it. But I mean, I know that I I know that I'm glad that you took a shot on us and I'm, you know, and I'm, I'm here if you need anything and we're always here to help out, you know? So well, I know y'all are doing a lot of advertising and things with like coast radio group and WLOX and, yep. and WXXV. And, and the one thing that got me was I was not getting service from the other company. Right. Let's put it that way. And it was, it was pretty bad to the extent that I, I was pretty upset about it. And I yeah. said, look, I've known Allen Beverages for years. They've always been there. They've all, and so I called up Morgan, Morgan right. Wheeler. Yep. And then talked to her and she was just, she was there on the spot. She called me back. I, I couldn't get a return call from the other company. And so she would call me back and, man, let me tell you who we had in here today. We had two of your employees in here today looking at our machine, trying to tweak it. I'm telling you, man, y'all y'all service is just undeniable. I appreciate that, Dave. When I talk about competitive advantage and talk about, you know, what I can control, you know, I can't control what my parent company goes up on, what our product costs. Right. You know, I try to absorb that as much as possible and, and try to not pass that down. But what I can control is, is I can control how much and how well I service my customers. Well, that's a, that's a fantastic thing, man. That That is customer service. And that, that's what I was going to talk about. Uh, customer service is everything. It is. If, especially if you're starting a restaurant and there's so many things that you as an owner have to worry about. Um, the one thing you that we try to take off your plate is if it's a beverage, you don't have to worry about it getting handled. It's going to that take that off your plate. You worry about the food side because as far as drinks and, and beverages are concerned, we got you covered. Yep. Y'all sure do. I know that. I'm very happy with y'all service for sure. Good. I'm glad, Dave. I I, 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 try, I take a lot of pride in how well we can operate as far as a service um, a service company, our service side. Um, we've made some pretty pretty big headway over the last five years or so and kind of overhauled that whole department. And um, I've got some great guys over there. Yeah, you sure do. That actually care about what they're doing and, and they they do a good job. So that's fantastic. Yeah. I can't thank them enough. You know what I mean? So let's talk about, okay, so you started to add new things to the menu. You said you added a quesadilla. So you would you say that the number one item that people come in is your chicken and waffles? That's correct. That's the number one thing they, they order. Some people, you know, they, they look at the sandwich and they go, wow, this is chicken and waffles. But uh, a lot of people love it. You know, it's I mean, it's a sandwich that has we cut it into a half and then we cut it into quarters and put, uh, you know, lettuce, tomatoes, onions, pickles, whatever you want on it. And and that's starting to catch on, too. Where are you? I know you're located in Diaberville, and I know that y'all specifically picked that area just because, you know, that's where all the growth is going. Right. It's it seems as if most of the coast, if it's not going up in that area, it's. It's hit or miss, but the one that is consistent is Diaberville. So y'all made that decision knowing that you wanted to be around the growth, correct? Yes, exactly. Um, we looked for a few different places down in the in, in the main part of Diaberville, down in the city, and those places just didn't fit us. So they were doing all this work on the you know the diversion area because they're going to put something back there. We were not quite sure what yet. We've heard about one, like four or five separate things. It could be could be Sports Illustrated, but they're they're eventually. I think they didn't spend all of that money back there to do the roads without something major going in there. Correct. And so we picked this spot directly in front of it. And so if they do happen to put hotels 
uh, in there were golden, you know. Oh, absolutely. I think you made a good call. Yeah. So we, we, we were strategic in where we went. And it's at the very end of Pops Ferry Road, right where Sangani goes, the Galleria exit is. So we're right off the interstate. And what's crazy is uh, we're getting so much road traffic from I-10. So people see restaurants near me and they're just coming right off the interstate and coming to our restaurant. That's such a great thing. And that's a lot, a lot of it of what's happening now is you kind of have to be mindful of that is people are just going to Google like a lot of people don't know what they want to eat. Right. They just like Google, you know, restaurants near me. And if you're if you're going up and down I-110 or if you're on I-10 and you pop up, they're like, oh, that sounds interesting. Rock and chicken and waffles. They're probably going to stop out, stop on in. Right. Exactly. And the other thing you have to do and you got you have to consider is you've got to keep up with your social media. I had a chef tell me that you had to post twice a day. You got to post in the morning and you have to post before dinner time in the afternoon. So we try to do that kind of thing. And we keep up with our Google, too, because the maps, uh, restaurants near me, is what a lot of people see. And they, right. they come to your restaurant. So so you, you guys are, you're, you're keeping up with your Google AdWords and all that. Yeah, you got to keep up with your media. Absolutely. Sure. We make a, a, a valiant effort here to try to keep up with it. You know, I, we have weekly meetings with, you know, Morgan and we have, a, we have our ad rep over in Fairhope Brook. We, we have meetings every Monday. We on calls and we have a laundry list of things we have to go through every week. So I totally understand. Right. You got, you got to keep up with your demo, your demographic, the people that that want to come in yeah, i mean you got to know who you're appealing to so you know you got to look at your data and um uh, and and see who's coming in who's not coming in you know that kind of thing are you doing any kind of and and i, I don't think i've ever t- talked with a restaurant owner about this are you doing any kind of you know doordash or anything like that like how does that how does that work that's funny we're so new you know that we've uh, actually uh, we're in talks with DoorDash now. Okay. To do that, and I was talking to some young people about this, and you know, it can it can get expensive. Yeah, that's what I wanted to. That's what I kind of wanted to know. Like, how well does the restaurateur make out when it comes to using a third party to deliver food? I think what they end up doing is is hiking up the price. Got it. So they put the menu on, and you, you still make what you're going to make, but they bump up the price for themselves. Okay, so it's the delivery, it's the it's the service fees. Right, exactly. And do you know that young people they don't care, man? They'll they'll do it. It's like some people just don't want to go out. Um, I was talking to somebody the other day, and they were ordering DoorDash from Chick Fil A. <laughs> say no i won't i listen i'm i'll i'll uh, i have two small kids so like if i'm worn out i'll bite the bullet and i'll order you know some food but i'm not gonna get a fast food restaurant delivered to the house right right no but way these younger I'll, people they'll do it all day long and it's, it's not that we're trying to take advantage or anything it's just the cost of doing business Absolutely. Yeah. I didn't know if that was something. Um, so what is it like a DoorDash rep that came to you and was like, hey, you know, we want to get you on. So like, do they have like active reps out there? Oh, they're calling constantly and they're coming in. And so they're trying to get us on board and we're we're right there. But I don't know that we've made an actual decision on that yet. I'd be interested to know how that goes before and after and see how well I it would affects. Too. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's going to be an adventure for sure. We've had a uh, we've had a company um, that used to it used to be called um, it was Waiter and then it became ASAP. I've met one of the reps a while at an event somewhere, and they were wanting to like, hey, we want to do business with you. And I don't think they understood what what it was that we did because they were talking about wanting to come by and just pick up like a single bottle here, a single bottle there, and just yeah, add them you... to the. I was like, well, that's not really how we operate. We sell by cases, right? You know, we don't sell by single bottles. You know, so it didn't. Yeah. That kind of was the end of the road for that right there. Exactly. 
I mean, you can't do business like that. I mean, you, it's got to be worth your while and it has to be worth their while. Absolutely. It's a partnership, right? Right. Exactly. Well, Dave, if someone was wanting to know what is the address, where, where could they go to get Rockin' and Chicken and Waffles? What's the address? The address is 4020 Pops Ferry Road, Diabraville, Mississippi. Okay. That's where we're located. If they could find out any more any more information online about you, where would they go to do that? They can go to Google and type just type in Rock and Chicken and Waffles, or they can go to Facebook and type Rock and Chicken and Waffles. I mean, we were lucky to get that, to get those names. No one else had it, huh? No, apparently not. So <laughs> So we wound up with them. Yeah, you can do Instagram and, and Twitter. I think it's uh, Twitter, too. Yeah, they changed the name of that to X. Oh, yeah, that's right. X. Yeah, I, I don't Elon ever. We don't, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't we don't really use Twitter. We have a, I think we have a Twitter account. We don't really use it a whole lot. Um, we're mainly just Facebook and Instagram. Um, right. I think a lot of people are moving off the platform to be honest. Yep, absolutely. So do you guys do weekly specials? Like, is there any, is there anything coming up? If you had to say in the next 60 to 90 days, what's the, what's on the horizon for Rockin' Chicken and Waffles? We like to participate in a lot of community events. And so uh, we have supported Impact uh, Soft Pitch Softball. Okay. So we're doing that. And we're also doing the uh, Gulf Coast Down Syndrome Society. The Buddy Walk. Yeah, the Buddy Walk. That's what we're doing. And that's coming up Saturday. So we are we like to participate in community events. If you're going to be a local business owner, you have to be part of the community. There, it's 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 not one one way or one another way. You have to kind of take the both in hand. So I totally understand. Right. We're also do we're you know we've been on like WLOX and WXXV in the kitchen. We're going to do that some more. We're trying to stay very active. That's good. Well, I know that uh, we've done a couple things for you. I'd like to probably within the next six months or so, I'd like to try to do another, maybe a full ad for you. Just kind of sit you down and maybe, because I know that uh, that'd probably be maybe for around your year anniversary. That'd be pretty neat. So Yeah, I think that we're going to be, um, we're going to be in your commercial. Y'all yep. have a commercial coming up in November. We did a, uh, it was a local eats ad. Yeah. Have you seen it yet, Dave? No, yeah, I actually did. Okay. I actually did. It was great. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad you like it. I have, I'm glad to get honest feedback because if it's all going to be done with your approval, we're not going to put anything out unless you, you guys like it. Yeah. And the, uh, that, I mean, it's, it's, it's wonderful. We really appreciate you guys, you know, a thousand percent. Y'all have really helped us out. I mean, y'all have helped us out as a business. And the way and the way that we kind of operate and the way I've always kind of looked at it is, you know, are you going to be a vendor or are you going to be a partner, right? Right. I think we're partners. Yes, absolutely. My job is to make sure that you don't have to worry about your beverages and to try to get people to come in. Because if right. they come in, they're going to order your food and they're going to come back and they're going to drink our drinks and we're going to, it's symbiotic. So that's kind of how I, I view the way that we do business. That's fantastic. I know that Morgan's been more than gracious to us with getting us banners and things like that for like cruise in the coast and oh yeah that's not a problem we have a print shop my cousin uh wesley runs the print shop in house so um you know if you give us enough turnaround within the next and if you give me about three or four days i can get anything done y'all have been more than gracious on that we also do offer like military uh first responder discounts and yep and things like that uh so we're very active in the community that's good to hear, Dave. Well, I just um, I, I really appreciate you coming on and kind of showcasing the restaurant a little bit, talking a little bit about your history. I like ta listening to to local business owners and restaurateurs and, 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 you know, basically anyone that has started something from the ground up. Um, it takes a lot, it takes a lot of work and effort and drive to, you know, pull the trigger on something that's unknown, especially nowadays. And I commend you on it because I think that y'all are kind of the backbone Local business owners are kind of the backbone of what makes this area really, really great. You know, I, and I appreciate the time, man. It's very difficult to, to, to launch one of these things. Oh, absolutely. And the, the way I look at it is if you grow it like a plant, you know, like a plant, eventually it'll grow and then you have expansion. Right. You can, so that's the way we're looking at it at this point. So I really appreciate you guys, too. Well, well, Dave, listen, we appreciate you, too, as well. If you ever need anything. 
uh, you know, you can reach out. You know, we don't really ever stop working. If, if I get a phone call in the middle of the night, we have 24-hour service, man. So we'll help you out. All right. That sounds fantastic. Thank you. Not a problem, Dave. And that wraps up another episode of Bottled Up. A big thank you to our guest, Dave Melton, owner-operator of Rock and Chicken and Waffles, for joining us today. It's great to hear about his and his team's dedication to providing excellent food, service, and their commitment to our wonderful community. Go see Dave and his Rock and Chicken and Waffles. Not only is the food off the chain, but supporting local businesses like Rock and Chicken and Waffles helps our coastal community thrive. Be sure to check them out on Google, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to stay updated on their delicious offerings. And as always, thanks so much for listening and stay tuned for more exciting episodes. And remember to always support our local businesses and restaurants. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the Bottled Up Podcast. Want us to deliver this show to your email inbox as they drop? Want to tell us about how you like the show? Or do you want to tell us about a Gulf Coast business or restaurant that you'd like for us to spotlight in any upcoming episodes? Email Morgan Wheeler at mwheeler, M-W-H-E-E-L-E-R at abevinc.com. That's A-B-E-V-I-N-C dot com. Want to know more about Allen Beverages and how we work with our clients, partners, and vendors? Check out allenbeverages.com. This show was edited and produced by Johnny Gwynn and Deep Fried Studios.